Hello, my friends. Welcome to The Greg Crino Show. In today's episode, I'm going to talk to a man who has spent a total of five years of his life at the bottom of the earth, Antarctica, and in the wintertime, no less, where it's like negative 80. He also has an incredible life story growing up in Wisconsin, joining the army during the Vietnam years, patrolling the DMZ in Korea, and just a bunch of other really cool things. So please welcome to the podcast, my good friend, Jerry Marty. Jerry Marty, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good. Uh, How are you doing? Just fine. Thank you. <laughs> this is a- Looking forward to telling you a story about a, a towhead farm boy growing up in southern Wisconsin who found himself with a 22-year career wow. working, employed at the Geographic South Pole, 90 South. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get right into okay. it. So you grew up in Wisconsin, am I right? Right. What I'd like to yeah. do is I'd like to break it into three components that uh, or, or phases that I went through in terms of realizing that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And number two is, is the sequence and the challenges along the way before I found myself uh, employed and actually making the first deployment to Antarctica. So with that, I'd like to start with the, the rural dairy farm. Yes, southern Wisconsin, a small uh, 86-acre farm, dairy farm in southern Wisconsin. And at that point in time, if there's, there was a, a town of about 2,500 to 3,000 population, Monroe, Wisconsin, that north, south, east, and west of that town were farms. And all of those farms basically had the industry of milking cows, and the milk would then go to the local cheese factory. So the main industry in that area, in that county, Green County, was uh, manufacturing cheese. Thusly, the parents, that was their their method of uh, income and revenue to support and raise a family. So I was one of those families south of, of the town of Monroe, But I was far enough south that the jurisdiction in terms of having a bus take you to school, first grade through eighth grade, grade, didn't apply because it was too too, uh, far of a distance. Therefore, those of us, again, on northeast, south, and west, that were that distance away from outside of that circle, found ourselves going to a one-room school. And the one-room school was, was a situation where the, the kids, the farm kids, would walk to school or ride bikes to school in the summer and the winter. And when I say ride bikes, it was a gravel road. And what we would do is we would, when it was time to go to school, uh, my two sisters and myself, we would, we would stand outside the, the house in the barn and look down the road to our left and there was a sequence. The group of kids that would go from that area to school, the family that was the farthest away, those ch- that child or children would start walking to the next farm, and they would pick up that one or two ch- uh, children there. And when they got to the Marty farm, they picked up myself and my two sisters. And away we went, and yes, it was about a mile and a half because I clocked it when I went back for one of my high school reunions from the school. And in a winter... We did walk in the snow, and it was deep snow. The the uh, only times that we didn't actually were that we weren't on our own going to school was situations where there were severe thunderstorms, or the temperatures and the wind were just brutally cold. Then my father would bring the farm truck up to the school and pick us up, or he may take us to school then come back and pick us up. As kids, of course. We, that got boring, so we had an alternative on occasion. We went through the neighbor's woods, and we walked through the woods, and we thought that was really fun because it was spooky. We carried our lunch pail, which our mother made uh, some lunch for us, usually a, a bologna sandwich or a peanut butter sandwich and probably with an apple, that sort of thing. And so we had a, had a, a lunch pail that we carried along with us, and we walked along a creek, and uh, actually called the creek, and uh, so... That was kind of fun and uh, kind of an adventure. Then you'd walk across the field with the cows, and then you'd get on the road, and you'd go up this real steep hill. And there it was on the left, the typical rural 
a setup where there's a one-room school and next to it is a church. And behind the church is the local community cemetery. And the one-room school had eight grades, first grade through eighth grade. And it had, when I was there, the, there was 13 students. Three of us graduated from eighth grade, okay? It had one teacher, 13 students, eight grades, and two outhouses. One for the boys and one for the girls. Just the basics. The, the basics, <laughs> that's for sure. What uh, years are we talking here, just to give the audience a perspective? Uh, let's see. Uh, I graduated in 1958, started high school in 60, so we back it off eight years. So we're in the 50s. We're in the, yeah, early, early 50s. Early 50s okay. yeah, yeah. It's, uh, the heat during the winter was a wood-burning stove that was in the center, up front in the center of the room. There was a building outside that was filled with wood for the heat. And one teacher with blackboards on the left and the right-hand side of the classroom would bring each class up, first grade, second grade, all the way through eighth, up to her table, and then she would, would go through the lesson plan for that day for that particular topic. The rest of us sat in, in uh, uh, seats in chairs uh, that the front was the back of the front was the back. They were lined up, and there was three rows of them. Then... If, in fact, there was something that needed to be addressed in terms of English and spelling, mathematics, that grade would then go to one of the, class, one of the uh, blackboards on the left and or the right. So you can imagine what it was like to be a student. When you're sitting there, you're trying to do your work, your homework, and at the same time, you're listening to the teacher up front teach the other classes. Then there's movement in the classroom where they're going up to the the chalk, the blackboards on either side of you, and you can hear this chalk back and forth, and then they have to clean the erasers out, or so they're snapping them together, and there's dust in the building and or outside the building. That was, a, it was a interesting. What happened along the way for myself in the fourth grade, up front also was a piano for uh, Christmas events and that sort of thing and music lessons, so to speak. And you had the uh, wood-burning stove, but there was a pull-down series of huge maps. One was the United States and all of the states, and the one behind it was the, a map of the world. And that was for basically for geography. So she would pull that down and explain the states, the capitals, and we, for the first time, and the only life that we knew, that I knew, was on this little farm. The only neighbors you had or people you socialized with was the down the road a mile or so would be the next farm, and my mom and dad would probably know them, and if they had children, then we would know them, and of course, we're picking up children as uh, friends of ours along the way. So that was, the outside world was, was so fascinating to me, as I'm sure it was to other children, is the fact that the, that the United States represented and, and reflected all of these states, etc., but what really caught my attention was the, the map of the world. And I realized these are areas that very few people had gone to before. And the teacher was interested in the fact that I was interested in it. And I kept asking questions, where is this and this? And what, how do they live there? And, and seeing that year after year, probably when I was now in the sixth grade, I realized that I told the teacher, I want to do that. I want to go out there and experience these places. And I want to go some to these places where very few, few people had been, almost like being an explorer. Thusly, the wanderlust spirit was formed uh, in my body. And I told the teacher, I said, someday, I'm not only going to go out there. I said, I think I want to go to Antarctica. And she said, well, you know, kind of laughed. And so I'm in the eighth grade, we've graduated, and now we're in, in high school. In high school, I continued thinking about Antarctica, although as a student from the rural school, everything was so new to me. I mean, just having gym class and having all of these things and all these kids around me were, were new. And so I was focused on being a, a freshman and a sophomore. 
By the time I became a, a junior and a senior and I had a car, and then my vision of the world and life expanded a bit, and I said, I definitely, definitely want to go to Antarctica because I found myself going to the library and finding the books about Admiral Byrd's expeditions in Antarctica. And I couldn't believe that, that there was a place where people went and lived and worked and performed scientific research, and that was their job, and they came back. And I said, that, that formulated the fact that I am definitely going to go to Antarctica. How am I going to get to Antarctica was the question of being in high school. In the senior year, we make decisions or before what we want to do with the rest of our lives. I had decided that during the summer, I had to work my way through the summer to get enough money to buy my car. And I worked for my uncle in this small town who was a uh, construction, had a construction company for residential housing. And so I became no preferential preference given to his nephew. I had to carry the, the, for, the forming boards. I had to dig the trenches with the shovels and everything. And so the two years of that, I told myself, I want to, be, I want to build something. That's what I want to do. And I said, that's exactly what I want to do. In southwest Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, Platteville was a school of mines and civil engineering school of, of, of uh, uh, prestige that the, the city of Los Angeles used to come out and recruit as many civil engineers as they could get going from Wisconsin back to, uh, to Los Angeles, which is part of my story a little bit later. And in, in doing that, I'm now saying that's what I want to do. And I also, so number one, I wanted to go to college. I knew I needed to go to college, and I chose civil engineering. That's actually interesting because guess what my major was in in college? Civil engineering. Civil engineering. Okay. Well, my my mine. I, I took. A, I took. There was a fork in the road, like and mines. I took. I turned to the right. So okay, I did All not. Right. Okay, here. So here I am in college, and uh, college uh, was you know a, a whole new experience from from high school, and so the first year of college, I'm in civil engineering. Uh, second engineer. Second year in college. Now this is. This is uh, 1964. The second year would be 1965. And Vietnam is now a, a, a common word in the household. And uh, the issue of GPA, maintaining a GPA, is, is of concern. It wasn't that of concern to myself, but I was realizing that to go to Antarctica, how do I do this? So at, it was in, at Platteville, I decided to write a letter to National Geographic. I said, I will not give up on this goal. I am going to do this. People told me I was crazy, made fun of me. I wrote the letter, and I received a response back. Oh, wow. Okay. And they said, we don't hire, but the United States federal agency responsible for the operations and maintenance of facilities in Antarctica is the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., Office of Polar Programs, why don't you write them a letter and see what they can do for you? In you know, about probably a month or so, a letter comes back, and they say, "Thank you, Jerry, but uh, here are here's we don't hire people directly, but here are four options. I think it was four. We'll go through them. Mm -hmm. Number one option is uh, when you graduate uh, from college, uh, join the Navy and uh, become a Navy CB." Then you too can go. You can go to Antarctica and be in some form, some position that would be responsible for operations and maintenance of one of our U.S. facilities. Number two is to go to college and then get an advanced degree, a PhD, and find yourself in a field of scientific research. Number three was the fact that you could become an employee with the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs, which would require a PhD. And that was the end of the letter. Tough options. Tough options. PhD or the Navy. <laughs> PhD. Or, <laughs> or, Ain't no easy way to get down there. <laughs> and so I, I told myself that, what am I going to do? And I said, I'm just going to sit on this for a while. 
and try to keep my GPA, GPA up. At the very same time, a, uh, the, the civil engineering group, there was, there was a new program being initiated into University of Wisconsin, Platteville. Today it's called construction engineering, a bachelor of science with a side program of project management. And I had heard that there was this thing about if you're a civil engineer, you're going to find yourself on drafting boards back in those days. And sometimes you'll be out in the field on highways and you'll be doing survey. But a lot of times you're going to find yourself in the office for the first year or two as a junior civil engineer. And I said, I don't want to do that. And, but this other, pro, this other program, I said, this could be the ticket. If, I, if, I, if I'm part of a construction, if I have a Bachelor of Science in Construction Engineering, with some management background, I could, that's maybe would get me to Antarctica, okay? But the question was, the focus was still on the GPA. I'm a sophomore going back to Monroe to work for my uncle again all summer in construction. I come back, I'm a junior, and I had found out that a friend of mine, during his summer season, found himself with the USGS, United Geological Survey, okay, US, okay. And he was assigned to a research vessel that went into the Antarctican waters, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation. And he said, Jerry, he said, I said, you've been to Antarctica? He says, well, not really. He says, I've been in the waters of 60 degrees south latitude, okay? And he said... He said, that is incredible. He says, you've been talking about this Antarctic thing. He says, uh, sorry to tell you, I got there first. So I, I said, fine. I said, what are the opportunities? And he said, based on what you're doing, he said, I've heard that the United States Navy is, is pulling out of Antarctica in that role because of the commitments for the Seabees in Vietnam. And he says, the federal government is now looking at and has a a federal support, government support contractor hired to, to handle that. They're going to hire all the people, the cooks, the, the mechanics, the people that help uh, military offload and fuel and that sort of thing. And they're located in Los Angeles, California. And he said it's, it's Holmes and Narver, only to find out, in, on finding out it's like a Fleur, Braun, Bechtel, Raytheon today, a support, government support contractor, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, so what I did then is I wrote a letter to them. I'm now a junior in college. You were determined. Well, yeah. the, 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 before I get into that is the fact, the answer is yes. I, I refused. I refused not to go to Antarctica. I had one other complication. My mother was a one-room school teacher herself, and she had beat it into my head of studying and to flash cards to memorize the state capitals. She really was focused on an education. I was the first candidate in our family to go to college. And so I'm wow. going, I said, so I, I'm going to uh, college. But when I went, they turned to me and they said, we, we definitely support you, but uh, we just don't have the finances to assist you. I'm now faced with if I want to get that degree and go to Antarctica, I'm going to have to go to college and pay for it 100% myself. So with that, I worked in P factors. I worked side jobs. I, I sometimes came back from construction early to get another small job. But it took me five years okay, to graduate, to get the Bachelor of Science. And that last year... Which is common nowadays, unfortunately. <laughs> but back then, you did it in five working your way through on your own 100 percent, with the exception yeah. we need more of that nowadays we're missing that <laughs> it was it was i had a wisconsin state loan and there was another one called a national defense loan and uh, i believe that one of them i actually paid off uh, on the dmc korea with my last paycheck and i think i still have and it was 48 dollars, but i paid it off myself <laughs> <laughs> now yeah the uh, letter to holmes and narver was returned. And it said, you know, thank you for your letter. Uh, we're interested in you, uh, but uh, here is the requirements. Number one, we want a copy of your, oh, you, we, we only hire individuals that have a Bachelor of Science, males only back then, and you will be hired as a GFA, General Field Assistant. You will be a laborer assigned to one of the U.S. Uh, scientific research facilities, 
and you'll be reporting to someone in the United States Navy working and supporting the science community that's at that station. Number two is you need to have a, uh, a uh, pass a military physical, they called it, to go to Antarctica. And you'll need to come to Los Angeles for the interview on your own, with your own money and no guarantees. And if you don't get the job, nice talking to you, no reimbursement. So I graduate in 1969. I believe I have $100 in my pocket, which was a lot of money. That's, and everything I owned was in a suitcase in a car that was a fraternity brother. And he had a job as a civil engineer. He's going to get good money. And I'm going out at the seat of my pants with 50, well, less than that, very low probability. Yeah. And I'm going to it's get almost like a one way ticket at that point. Went pretty much. <laughs> and I, I, I had a suit and tie of some sorts. I walked into that office in Los Angeles and I looked around. I saw probably 20 guys and I went, these guys are from University of, of uh, Minnesota. They're from Alabama, could be Harvard. They could be SC. Stiff competition. Tough competition. Yeah. I'm at a smaller university. And I said, told myself, I'm walking out of here with this job. Again, that determination. I, f I said, I am going to do this. At the end of the day, I was one of four in that group that was selected. Wow. So I'm graduating. And now the last chapter of uh, Jerry on his way to uh, South Pole as a career is that uh, that's good. But it's uh, June of uh, 1969, and we don't actually deploy until September, October into Antarctica, that first phase being getting your passport, getting your medical, uh, you know, all of that sort of thing, and a meeting in Virginia with the science community. Now what do I do? I don't have any money. So I mooched, leached off of my fraternity brothers who were city of LA employees, so they got tired of me, and I had to lean on uh, family relatives from th that I had in uh, Southern California, and they helped me out for a month or so, and then I'm off to the uh, Washington, D.C. for the indoctrination. That included going to Davisville, uh, Rhode Island, to work with the Navy on their transportation and movement documents, okay? And with that, I finished that up, and then we're on our way to Antarctica. Wow. And how old are you at this point? You're, you're just out of college. Yeah, so I'm 23. Okay. 23 that's, years old. That's pretty right? good. Though. Actually, coming up on, uh, yeah, 23, just across 23. So you first learned about Antarctica in grade school, and then by the time you're 23, you're on your way there. Yes, that's, uh, that's good. Achieved the goal. Yeah. The interesting thing was I achieved my goal and I'm going to go to Antarctica. We learned the system on how to handle cargo, how to market uh, per Navy regulations. And so we're shipping out, so to speak. And we don't, I'm not on a commercial airline, although I've only been on one my entire life the f one time, and that was going from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. for the uh, indoctrination with the National Science Foundation. It's an LC-130 aircraft, and it's loaded. This is going from L.A. to D.C. in an LC-130? We went all the way. On, that, on, that's on, the one that's reserved for Antarctica, I thought. The, well, in this case, it, at that, that was back in those days, was VXE-6, United States Navy, and it, it was the okay. it was the LC-130 that still had the retractable, you know, the wheels and, and the skis. Right. So it in those days, I'm going to say it was a routine. I could be error there, but the for the majority, they would fly out of the United States. But in this case, to get from where we were, where we were to Travis, it was a Herc, was that they went all the way to New Zealand on a Herc, and then from there up to South Pole. That was your entire ride to Antarctica. From Okay, repeat that again. From Did, Travis all the way to... Okay, the year I went down, yeah. you went from Davisville, Rhode Island, to Travis in a Herc. Which, with the cargo. For people who don't fly, especially going west, th that's normally a five-and-a-half-hour flight on a 737. On a C-130, we're talking eight hours it's it's not comfortable. <laughs> so yeah. then and you get I'm, to I'm Travis. sitting here, and two three feet in front of me, I could put yeah. my feet, my 
and I've got my my gear with her on to cargo. Mm-hmm. And I got all these uh, yeah. loadmasters yeah, running around telling me C-130 to get my, my long f- distance is not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> telling me to get the feet off the cargo. Yeah. We land at Travis and we get out refueling. So we go into the terminal station. And I'll never forget that. I walked in and uh, sat down and I looked over and here were all these GIs. And they all were going to Vietnam and they were signing, writing letters to their family. They were calling and they looked at me and I looked at them and I'll never forget the disdain that was written on their faces. Oh man. They knew that I was their age and, and I had longer hair and they assumed me probably just an old, a hippie of sorts and you're, you're going someplace. We're going to Nam and you're going someplace else. Yeah. I'll that's never, a, that's a ever, tough time. That was tough to see. Yeah. Especially because you, you probably empathize with them. Well, yeah. Okay, there's a. I'll finish. Okay, yeah. I'll answer that question. Okay, get to, okay. okay, is the fact that from there you went to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Now in Hawaii, it seems to me that there was refueling and some maintenance check that required an overnight. Perfect. We're straight out of college, and there's four of us, and we got to drive around Hawaii. It was just I had never seen the ocean before. It was incredible. Then we're off to American Samoa, Pango Pango. Then we go to Christchurch, New Zealand, and there we get our uh, emergency cold weather gear. We get all our stuff put together, and we file the paperwork, and now we're heading to McMurdo, 2,500 miles. This is from American Samoa, or no, no Christchurch. From Christchurch, another 2,500 miles. And to, with the wind, okay. it could be up to five to six hours, sometimes eight, in a 130. And where is that? that is that on Antarctica? It's, it's, it's an island. It's, it's considered Antarctica, yeah. It's okay. the southernmost, uh, closest point to New Zealand. And that's okay. we'll go into that a little bit later in the, okay. in, the, in the logistics. I spend the night in McMurdo, and I'm looking at the... There's an uh, active volcano, Erebus, there, and I'm looking around seeing glaciers everywhere and penguins, and I go, wow, I'm in Antarctica. And some Navy guy comes up and he says, you're not in Antarctica, you're on an island. And I says, well, I'm going to Bird Station. He said, ah... <laughs> All Navy said, good luck, buddy. And I went, wow. So I'll, away I go, fly off the bird station. And I get off the plane with my two duffel bags. And I look out and I went, wow, what a place. And this Navy chief came up to me and told me that he, he didn't, didn't like civilians. And, and he said, I understand you have a deferment. He says, yes, I do. And he says, he says in, in different English language, he said, I'm going to run you out of this station, young man. And I, I flat turned to him and I said, we'll see. Tough crowd. I'm telling you, <laughs> Travis and down there. <laughs> the uh, experience was incredible. And uh, the individual and I uh, finally became good friends because I told myself, I'm, I'm going to outwork every single one of these CBs. When they asked me to clean the bathroom or to do this and that, I was always there early and always there a little bit later. And I attribute that to the work ethic of growing up on a farm. My father was Swiss, descended, and everything had to be perfect. And it was just something about what a great place to be born and grow up and be raised in, but a southern community like that. Mm -hmm. And I attribute to that. I I just had had the work ethic. It It was part of life. It was part part of my DNA. At the end... I flew back. Well, you talked about interesting people. At that particular time, there was the U.S. was planning uh, NASA to go to the uh, to the uh, moon, and astronauts and uh, the the agency NASA came down and would go to some outlying stations to include Bird to do uh, wheeled track vehicles in deep uh, soft snow uh, for the first lunar uh, voyage on the moon and there were two two astronauts astronaut Deke Slayton which mm-hmm. is one of the original seven mm-hmm. and Dave Scott and okay. I had challenged this guy this uh, senior chief that uh, well let's let's see who's better and he, I said let's see who gets the first state flag from their state to fly here he says I got it well I got my flag from Governor Knowles Wisconsin first and it was flying next to the US flag his came a week later, so it was, a, it was a, almost a photo finish for that. These people came out of the plane, 
and this was when I realized that this, this way of life is really exciting, is that one guy, the guy stood up on the top on the steps coming down from the Herc, and he said, uh, who in the hell's from Wisconsin? And I went, I am. He says, well, yeah, you're going to be with me or I'm going to be with you. And it was Deke Slayton who oh, was wow. from Wisconsin. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. The, when did he end up going? He, he was scrubbed on the first, on, when he was with the seven because of heart murmur. Okay. Then he, he, did, he did go make a, a, uh, a flight. He did. Uh, okay. I, I can't remember which year it was. Okay, but he did end up going. Yeah, then he ended up okay. working in Houston Control. You'll see his picture when you have uh, uh, Jim Lovell saying, Houston, we have a, a, a problem. Okay. You see him in the background with the flat top, kind of okay. blondish hair. Okay. Which I have my picture with him. But long the, moon, the moon and Antarctica are probably not entirely <laughs> strange places. <laughs> probably the people who want to go to one are not yeah. too averse to going to the other. One interesting thing was on our way out, the Herc. It's an open field runway. In those days, we didn't have the, uh, the equipment to maintain a, a, a density, compaction the, that we needed all the time. And so JADO, Jet Assistant Rock Takeoff, was put the four canisters on one on each side. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, I'm now back in the Herc. I've got my gear on. There's more cargo. And we take off, and I said, well, you know, we're going to fire these. They're going to be a little bit loud. And if it doesn't work, we're going to bring the nose down, and then we're going to have to rearrange it and sort of thing. He says, but don't go, don't go moving around, because if any one of these canisters flies off the bracket. And I went, oh, gee. <laughs> you know, yikes. <laughs> we take off, yeah. and they're kind of bouncing a little bit. He's trying to get the nose ski up so he can get the lift, and he brings her back down. He says, that's it. We're coming back around. We're going to uh, jettison these, and we're going to put eight more on. But... We think that we can solve it. All of you civilians, all you passengers are going to go to the back of the aircraft where the, there's the angle ramp. Yeah. And you're going to lay on that as cargo oh my so that God. we could get a little bit of a lift. The thing, this would make any airline cringe right now to have people, or even, even the Air Force, but you got to do what you have to do down there. Yeah, and I think that it, uh, it's high probability that uh, they did just take the civilians. They took uh, uh, loadmasters, wherever they could get X number of pounds that they felt was going to give us lift, and it roared again, and we took off. Wow. My first time. Were you in the airplane when the rockets yep. went off? Yep. Okay. In both cases. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's impressive. I've seen that on videos. I've never experienced it. But, uh, yeah, to be in a C-130 with rockets, is that, that's impressive. Before I got on the aircraft, I looked around, and I said, I came to Antarctica from a one-room school in fourth grade, basically. I wanted to go to Antarctica and be part of it. And I said, now I have a problem. It's now a part of me. I now was confirmed that it was, this is what I wanted to do. Everything from now on was, this was going to be my career. And I said, I'm going to go back. And if my performance review is good, I'm going to volunteer. I want to come back and winter over. Okay. So yeah, now away I go, back to Holmes and Arbor. Mm-hmm. I, I get in, I out, you know, do all the in processing, that sort of thing. And I said, uh, you know, I wanted to, they, they wanted to keep you as a GFA so that if you wanted to be part of this organization, these were international contracts, they wanted to do a uh, OJT, on-the-job training, to see how Jerry's going to perform. And is he really they got the right stuff to go into remote areas and be a young engineer but right now, let's put him down in where he's, he's in a dish pit, you know, and doing snow mm-hmm. melter. They said uh, you know, that uh, my, my uh, performance review was exemplary. And he said, uh, get ready to go with one exception. What is it this time? The government will not allow us to give you the second deferment. We're now 1970. Okay. Okay, Vietnam. Yeah, almost. And, and I'm, I'm 24. Yeah. And here, and so you're on your own. So I changed the Selective Service Board from Wisconsin to California and wrote a really nice letter, of course, and mm-hmm. the fact that I'm working for the government and blah, blah, blah. And I jokingly say it took about 32 seconds and I had the answer, and that was no. Oh, no. Oh, and I forgot. At, yeah. at, at Bird Station, the best thing, the funniest thing that happened, the, the Seabees kept 
continuously talking to me about getting drafted, and I'd look so much better with a short haircut and, and wearing all green and being in Vietnam like a lot of them had, and they couldn't wait for the day, okay? Yeah. The lottery came into place in 1970, and my number was a low number. They had a party that went till four in the morning thinking, it's, it's going to be great to see you. You're, gonna, you're out of here. You're on yeah, your way to Nam. Yeah. Get ready. And so, so I told myself, what am I going to do? In Santa Monica and in Venice, there were a groups of, of, of uh, companies and some attorneys that had a program, an option. If, in fact, yes, I went to two of them just to see what was going on. At the age of 24, if you processed enough paperwork and choked the system and then dr drugged the time of one year until you're 25 and not eligible, high probability that they'll, they'll, they'll ignore it after a while. And here's the fee. And I looked at myself and I said, I could go to Canada. And I said, that's not going to happen. I said, my high school friends have been to Vietnam and back if they made it. College fraternity brothers drinking beer together have been there and back, etc. I said, it's my turn to belly up to the bar. Okay, good for you. And yeah. so I, what I did is I walked, told the uh, Holmes and Arv, I'm going to walk downtown with a pen in my hand. I'm going to go into the first recruiting station and I'm going to join. It was downtown LA someplace. It was the Army and the E5 that was a recruiter. Couldn't believe it. He says, you got to be kidding me. He says, I, I'm not supposed to say this, but he said, you're you're going to go OCS, you're going to become a second lieutenant, and you're going to go to NAM. He says, it's your infantry, infantry. And yeah, I, Army I said, infantry is no I, joke. And I, I, I said, I am here to join, I'm here to join. And he said, he said I, can't, I can't believe it. I said, give, give me the pen. And I signed, and then that was it. Mm -hmm. wow. That's the story on, on being in the service, and in the service was, was infantry, infantry, with the exception of this issue in uh, North Korea where we became the, the spear point, and that's what the engine pin has, is that they were coming south in the three tunnels, mm -hmm. and up on the DMZ, I'm sure you've been up to, you see that there's, yeah. the, there's the bluff, and then there's the Imjim River. Uh, I don't bluff. remember that specifically, but I, I was there about 20 years ago. Okay, yeah. depends how far east or west. We were uh, just to the west of uh, Parmesan, okay. which had Camp Casey. So I, at Liberty Bridge, you go over the bridge, which is white now, and it's a railroad track, is okay. the fact that up on that bluff, and they had practiced before it was taken, it was at the vehicle, the M113, the, the vehicle transport, mm -hmm. to get down there and get across the water, and they sank. <laughs> but the issue was there was no way we could get back off that sea. And they were, our job was, we were to spear point. We were basically just click the mic and have the guys come up from the sky, and we would be the first bump in the road for them. Yeah, yeah, that, that was... Uh... That was funny. I was there in, in 2000, so quite a bit later. But that was the the overall feeling was that the DMZ was the speed bump, and so things are changing now. But but that's a that's a definitely a scary area. But, well, so, I, I, we if we're running out of time, then we'll no, move on to the next. We're, one. we're not getting. We're not running out of time at all. We got ton, <laughs> a ton of time. So you're you're in the army at this point, and then how long were you in the army? Uh, just less than two years. And the reason okay. oh did not go OCS qualified. Okay, but Holmes and Arbor said, if in this particular period of time, if you join the military, if you're drafted, we're a government support contractor. You will be guaranteed to have your job back, and your desk will still be here when That's you great. come back. Yeah. Okay. So I, I said to the uh, to the uh, I guess it was in basic. No, it must have been in. Uh, when did we do the OC, OCS uh, testing? It must have been in. Uh, induction center, something in, in, along the way. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, you're on your way. And I said, I, there was another option, is if you do the two-year plan, which I said, the reason I said, well, I have the job. I have an obligation to my country, and I'm going to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And wherever they send me, that's where I'm going, is that you do the two years, and then you can come back. You're eligible for the two years. As, so you're going to be an NCO. Okay. Okay, so you go through a basic... Then you go through, uh, 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 what was it, Fort Polk, home of the infantrymen for Vietnam. They had all these mocked-up villages yeah. and the Claymore experience. Well, to Wisconsin and Antarctica and Fort Polk, it's like, <laughs> then I'm you, you must like the pain. Yeah. You, you love the I pain. I have a threshold for it. You have a very high threshold. So yeah. is the fact that the, uh, and so, so I find myself yeah. at Fort 
Benning in 1971. Another garden spot? Not only a garden <laughs> spot, it was Callie was on trial. Oh, wow. Oh, the camera people, and, the, and they could not move infantrymen, OCS, airborne, ranger through there quick enough to get into Nam. It was just a zoo. Yeah, here so we are. This is so Callie was on trial at Fort Benning. Benning. Okay, and for people who don't uh, know that uh, Lieutenant Callie was uh, convicted of basically war Milai. crimes, the Milai massacre, yeah. uh, definitely a dark point in our uh, our history. So yeah, I just wanted to fill that in there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So you so you went through training, got out of there, right? Uh, and, and then what happened? Well, along the way. At a bar one night before I went into the service, I, I ran into the young lady you just met. <laughs> we became, we got married with, uh, after 40, we're at 49 years, I guess. Okay. Wow. Is that we just back and forth before email and Skyping, we decided that maybe we should get married. And when I told her, told her I said, we, we shouldn't do this, not with my MOS, right? Mm-hmm. And so then when I said, well, you're going to go to Korea, but they really, I didn't know we were going up on the DMC. It didn't matter. Follow orders. So we got married and, uh, Elena, how do, wait, how do I get, we got married and I came back. Let me go back to, it was short of two years because Nixon was pulling troops out of Vietnam in 1972. And, and if in fact, even Nam, if there was two places they were pulling them back with what they call an early out. And it was Vietnam, and you had to be Vietnam combat, or the DMZ Korea, and it had to have orders to confirm that you were in a what they called a hazardous duty, hostile fire zone. Right. You'd come back early. And so uh, myself, we were on patrol, came back, and they said the following names, pack up your stuff, you guys are okay. heading back home. Okay. So sort of a side benefit, I guess, if you will, there... Uh, to the withdrawing down in Vietnam is that you were in a combat zone, just not Vietnam, and that order applied to the DMZ. Only the only place only the, in the world was it, and, and it was other not than Vietnam. Yeah, and it was okay. not if you had served in Korea. It had to be that you had orders to patrol that 38th parallel fence. The wire. So a very small set of people. That is true. And that, that was, is true. That was you. Wow. Okay. I've I've flown many missions. I've never actually. Well, I visited the DMZ as part of a tour, but it was not. A patrol, but I've flown over it many times. It's it's quite a place. It's very stark to the difference, especially day and night. You can see it's all well lit up. It's very well lit now, and then north it's just all black. You can't see anything until probably Pyongyang is like a little glow on the horizon. But yeah, and then Seoul sits right there, fifteen million people or so. So it's a uh, it's quite a place. Yeah, that's fun. And it's another time we'll do the, over a, a libation. We'll, yeah. We went back on our yearly international trips, and we did uh, one to uh, South Korea, and uh, I was able to go back yeah. and stand there and look around. And, and uh, When was the last time you were there in South Korea? This, we're at uh, tw- uh, 2018. Oh, it's very recently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, you know, it's amazing. I, when right. I was there, in, I was there for a year in 2000, and... Of course, it, it was a very, it was an advanced place. It was, it was nice, but there were pockets of it that were not, that were still stuck back in the 1960s. Fast forward, I went back last year in the summer of 19, and it's impressive how, how well that country has done, how much they've advanced. And they're just leaps and bounds ahead of the North Koreans now. It's just, they're not even the same country. They're not the same people. I mean, the, the South Koreans are very westernized. There is, yeah. Big and tall as any yeah. people in, in Europe or North America, um, but the, the average North Korean is probably like five foot six. They're just it's it's pretty sad the the contrast. But um, but yeah, I think it's an impressive place now. So wow, so that's quite a journey uh, from Wisconsin to Antarctica to to South Korea. Um, how about just we can get into let, let's get into like what you were doing in Antarctica. The logistics of getting there and your job. If this gets too detailed. No, we've got know. plenty of time. This is okay, fantastic. Going to Antarctica is, is one thing. The uh, recognition of, of uh, where you're going uh, is, is interesting. Uh, Antarctica is a, is a continent, the seventh continent. And it originally it was part of the super continent, Pangaea Gondwana land. And that was 180 million years ago. And as this started to 
break apart and the land masses accordingly started to drift and move around and find themselves in the pattern as we know our planet earth right the countries the uh the the, the uh let's stop with that mm-hmm. is that from from 180 million years ago when it started to break apart 80 it's been 80 now, 100 million years it took to get to where it is now. And it's been at that location of 90 degrees south latitude for 80 million years. And what's interesting about that is the fact that when it broke away, the configuration was that uh, the one side, the east side, was a part of Africa. The west side was part of the east side of South America. Thusly... Antarctica, as it came became south, and the reason that this is uh, known is that the scientists have found fossilized bones of, of uh, dinosaurs and uh, fossils showing uh, the uh, the uh, foliage, the plant life, and uh, uh, life in the water. That it was a Jurassic Park at one point in time. It was oh, it wow. was totally a Jurassic Park with with nothing but the the uh, the dinosaurs, the food chain, the dinosaurs, the food, the foliage, the small anim- animals and uh, uh, light wildlife, etc. And it's now at 90 degrees south. And just a, it's larger than the United States and Mexico. It uh, 98 percent covered with ice that averages. Some places over two miles thick. South Pole Station was 9,300 feet divided by 5,280. Gives you just about two miles. It's way up there. So the South Pole, yeah, yeah, the yeah. South Pole itself is 9,000 plus feet above sea level. At the point where that is surveyed at, at the pin, at, at, at surveyed at 90 degrees south latitude, it's, it's listed at 9,300 feet. Wow. Okay. And uh, the it's it's. 5.4 million square miles. Mm-hmm. 90% of the world's ice and 70% of the world's fresh water is, is located uh, in, in that location. Yeah, it's an impressive area. So it's, it's a remote, the reason for saying this, it's a, it's a very remote, inhospitable location with cold temperatures and access is uh, challenging and maintaining uh, facilities for individuals is uh, necessary and uh, very challenging. Mm -hmm. The project that I was involved with was the replacement of an existing scientific research facility at South Pole with one that was outdated. And a scientific research facility is what? It's a facility that is built to allow scientists to take their grants or their specialty in terms of of scientific research to Antarctica and have a place to set up their instruments, record data, and get it back to their institutions for analysis, which means we have to basically build and maintain a city to support the scientific community at that location, not only during the summer, but during the winter months of 24 hours of darkness and temperatures that'll go to at South Pole minus 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Now, what, what is a city? What, what do we have to build? And I'm, I'm saying this because this, is, mm-hmm. this was the project. Yeah. Each one, there was three stations. The Navy built one in 56, 56 and 57 at South Pole by the Navy Seabees. Uh, that was the first time we had wintered over scientists or anyone had wintered over at the South Pole ever. It was and in 56. 56 and 57. Nobody had spent a, a winter, no, a full the, winter until those years. The only human beings that ever had been there before was the race, race between Raoul Amundsen and uh, uh, Robert Scott. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, Amundsen got there on uh, December 14th, uh, 1911. Mm-hmm. And Scott got there on January 7, uh, 17th. 2012, or 1912. 1912, yeah. Amundsen made it back. Uh, Scott and his uh, uh, team perished on a return wow. back. Uh, they ran into bad weather. 
uh, there wasn't a, a re, the resupply was was less than a half a mile away, and they they perished uh, wow. because of the cold. They they were just totally exhausted and didn't make it. But so what do you have to do? You have to have a city. So if you have a city, you have to have a place for the scientists. You have to have housing. Scientists want to eat, so you have to have a food service. You have to have a hospital, so you have to have some sort of a medical yeah. facility. The only way to get into these places, in the most cases, is yeah, you need an airport. Now, it won't be LAX, but if you, it'll be one for 130. It might, might be better than LAX, LAX <laughs> yeah. to be honest with you. <laughs> You're going to need communications within the station, within the city, yeah. and with the outside. You need a public works department to handle all the utilities to make sure that you have a power plant, that you have electricity, and you have water and, su- water and sewage issues. You need to have a place for the scientific research where they can go and collect samples and lo- learn the things. You need to have uh, issues with safety. You need to have a place for recreation. You need to have fire department, fuel storage, cargo processing, waste management, and administration. All of that has to be provided for X number of scientists, and that's where the support contractor comes into place. They build the facility, and they hire the people that will provide the entire operational aspects necessary to run the city so that, let's say it's 50 scientists can come in, they can do their work during the daylight, get set up other instruments, and then they will leave a small complement of scientists there during the winter in the darkness to actually perform the experiments. So the logistics happen during the summer months when it's easier to to build and transport supplies in and out. And then once winter happens, most of that stops. And then that's when the scientists will winter over, as you say. Correct. And it's a smaller number of them. You said maybe 50 of them. Each station has a population basis of design based on the amount of fuel and the size of the generators because that requires bringing Herks with fuel tanker flights only into these locations to stockpile the fuel. Okay, so fuel is the limitation. Fuel, fuel, yeah, and okay. uh, hold that thought because there's okay. there's a, a LC one thirty limitation also. Okay, is the fact that the second so so the second uh, that station succumbed by Mother Nature by drifting up. Anything that's set on the continent of Antarctica, Mother Nature will claim by drifting at some point in time. Oh, the snow will just cover it. The snow will cover it. It's okay. not a lot of snow, but it's a period of time, period of the ice movement and the snow that will, will crush it. In this case, it was prefabricated plywood facilities. And as it built up, they actually built ec- the uh, exits from the inside. They extended the ladders up, and it step kept crushing and crushing, and they tried to reinforce it, and they couldn't. So they moved on, and they built a geodesic dome which was the second station, which Elaine and I were both employees at with the Homes and Arbor in 74, 75. And we were part of the, I'm a, I'm a junior uh, engineer, assistant project manager at this time. And one of the projects was to complete a punch list. The Navy had moved on its way to Vietnam and there was still some, they were almost finished with the facility. And that year was a, a year that it would be dedicated and it would be the year that the first time that someone would winter over again in 1975, although there's winters each. I forget that sentence. There, we had winter, mm-hmm. we, the station, while it was built, the other station was active. Okay. Was How far apart are these stations? Uh, the, the old South Pole station is, is uh, less than a mile. So it's a fairly small footprint and it's right, right there at the 90 degree point. Yep. yep okay. Yep. Um, I, I've got, uh, hold on a second here, just at, uh, let's see what we have. Uh, a station at the South Pole is basically one square mile. That's it. That's that's one station. Now, is that, are there many one square mile areas or just there was one one square mile area that has a few stations in it um, if, if it depends upon where you are if you're okay. at if you're uh, on the coast but at the island of McMurdo that's the main logistics hub for Antarctica for the United States okay and they have a thousand people in the summer and uh, you know 600 in the in the winter and that's most, primarily that's where all the supplies come in okay and all the personnel come and go uh Early on, we actually just, just, you're familiar with this, the fact that on the way back from McMurdo, at the end of the season, you would take a Herc back to uh, to uh, Christchurch. 
But before, sometimes, there were, at the early years, it was a 141. Okay. And that is really a, a difficult flight. As you know, they got the rail down the center, and they got two rows of people with their knees against their knees on this side. Yeah. The same over here. You washed your clothes, but they're still, they're still off-gassing fuel. Yeah. You've had uh, two showers per week, two minutes only. And so <laughs> it's not a, yeah. Uh, okay, long story short is, Step up is, is, is that That's funny. I was part of the team yeah. that finished the punch list for the dedication of the Dome in 1974-75. Okay. It was that very station that had exceeded its design life and needed a new facility that would be adequate to handle 21st century science and a larger population. Okay. It, the, um, let's take it to the point. The agency that was responsible for the project was the National Science Foundation Office of Polar Programs. Mm -hmm. Their job was to manage, maintain the, the schedule, the budgets, the basis of design, and work with the support contractor to ensure that each season's work was accomplished because if you didn't complete one facility so it would be transitioned to the next, you'd, you, there was no way for that winter over then to continue because you would jeopardize their safety. My job was in part of that organization. I was the, the uh, project's NSF construction project manager. And then on the summer season and the winter, the summer seasons were 110 days only. Then you have the full winter of darkness mm -hmm. and, and temperatures that dropped to 100. Is that I had the requirement was to deploy each year. You would arrive when the station opened due to temperatures being uh, above 40 degrees below zero so that for aircraft and not have the contrails in, in the back of the aircraft for loading and offloading, you'd get there uh, November 1 and leave February 15th every single year. And we had to, I was the individual on site that if there were any issues that changed, which they change daily, we basically always joked and said, we have a schedule, we have a plan, so we've spent an entire three, four months working on this. When you get to South Pole, you kind of set it aside because every day things will change on you. And, and mm -hmm. so you worked as a team. I worked with the, the, the support contractor, did not report to me. They had a contract with the National Science Foundation. But in terms of working as a team for the schedules, the on-site challenges and solutions, and the budget, that's what, and supporting science in terms of what they had planned to bring in and didn't bring in, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The station that was approved was designed for 150 people during the summertime. So when we built housing, we had to build a station that would allow for 150 bedrooms, lodging. Yeah. Okay. And of that, and then in the winter, the population, it was designed for 50. And that yep. normally broke down to in the range of 70 to 75 percent support personnel and 25 percent scientific scientist. Okay. Interesting. So they have, so it goes down to, from 150 down to about 50 or less. It's, okay. a, it's a function of the types of scientific research. Okay. And uh, the type, the, the man, the scientific manpower required uh, to winter over. And I should say at this time, uh, there are PhDs that are, are you have male and female scientists. Mm -hmm. Now, the the period of time you said summer was their summer is November, or at least the logistical summer was November first to February first, and then wintering is from February first for the remainder of the year all the way up through November again. That is correct. Okay, yeah. so they're really like spring and fall are sort of non-existent, at least in terms of scheduling. Okay, so it's just a very short summer than a very large winter. Interesting. Okay. And what, um, what science would happen down there? What did you observe other people doing? Who, who was there? The, uh, the United States has three winter over scientific research locations. One's at McMurdo and one's at Palmer station, which is on the peninsula going up to uh, Ushuaia. And, uh, the reason for that is the proximity to get to them, to support them. As is, as is around the continent, it's a function of if you're looking, if you're going to be studying things in the water, your base will be 
more open, next, as close as you can get it to the water. If you're looking for things that you want to go up into the where there's some mountainous areas or if you want to look at glaciology, you'll be over in an area, you'll have a station that's in that area. South Pole is interesting because it's so high and Antarctica has 3% humidity. It's so dry that it's perfect for uh, gl- climate change and NOAA's operation in terms climate change of, research. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and it was one of the first one of the first scientific research projects in 1956-57, although not near as sophisticated as NOAA has it today. In addition to that, there's uh, in the winter time it is so dark and so crystal clear that it's perfect for telescopes like the Hubble. And the type of research on the International Space Station is because it's so clear, you can see so far out. It also has a wedge that is from 90 degrees south to the nearest human being. It has a very little contamination of the air that would impact, hamper good vision. Yeah. Well, and it's, very, and it's high altitude, too, which I didn't realize. Well, you're up there at 9,000, 10,000 feet. Barometric pressure equivalent on any given day, or I shouldn't say that, at certain periods of the year, will take you to almost 11,000. Those of us who are acclimated after being there for a month, yeah, all of a sudden you go, you know, go, hey, Greg, boy, what's the, what's the barometric pressure today? I know we're kind of breathing hard here, having coffee. You can uh, feel it, yeah. Yeah, yeah you definitely, it's noticeable. Yeah, it's funny. I've tried... Um sleeping at 12,000 feet and it's it's it was almost impossible <laughs> i mean they yeah like i you exhale and then your heart rate goes down so low it's like you feel like it's not going to come back it's uh it's uncomfortable the the I, the thing that is was challenging is the fact that you the government government mandate was for approval of the station which was not a surprise to us. It's, it's, it's a way of life, but they, was that you had to maintain a full operational city with all the functions I just mentioned, 24 by 7, while you're at the same time you're building that particular, let's say it's the area that's uh, fuel storage, of which the fuel storage is 450,000 gallons of uh, A and 8 fuel in 10,000 gallon tanks that we put in. Before you leave the station, otherwise you would compromise the entire season, and the station would have to be shut down. We had, we started with one project, the fuel storage, and took the old technology of of the day, the Navy, the fuel bladders, and they were mm-hmm. twenty five thousand gallon fuel bladders on the, on the surface of the snow with a corrugated arch, metal arch. We had to take those. Manually, we had to come in with a, with a vehicle, a forklift, and take those, drain them down, take them, put them up on a surface, and hook up an entire system without interruption that would take it over to the power plant. Power plants no, normally, well, they do. They have one generator online, one at the ready, and one in maintenance. Okay. Then, as we had a schedule to excavate snow, get the compaction what we needed, bring in fuel tanks. The boats, so that they had uh, they had uh, leak detection, f- fuel containment if they leaked, and there was fire suppression. We stack three on the bottom, two on the top, move forward, and, and do this nine times. That gets you the four hundred and fifty. If there was weather delays on the one thirty aircraft that we had planned coming in, many times we were receiving the materials just as we needed them, or we couldn't get some repairs parts that we needed, even though the plans were as meticulous as you could put together. We were to a point where we were concerned that we couldn't get the system totally integrated and operational before we left. We had people working around the clock to do that, and we were able to, but every single season, with all the planning that we did and more, there was always something that came up that pushed us to the point where, by the, by the time most people, I left 
weighing 10 to 15 pounds less than I do now. It was just the the stress, the pressure. You're always working. You were always working for 24 by 7. And and it was important that what you were doing. So if you, you you said that you had to have a certain amount of fuel before you would leave, and and that's because you couldn't get back in to replenish it if something went wrong? Right. So you had all these reserves, and if you left and something went wrong, there was a period of time where those folks are on their own. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's critical then. Yeah. We, to, the, uh, they actually, the new right. station had an emergency uh, pod that if there was a fire in the, uh, well, the design was this two story uh, above surface structure mm-hmm. for the habitat. Most of all of these, okay. but the industrial complex, that was 60,000 square feet. Then 40 feet, Below the surface of the snow with an arch over it was the industrial complex. Over here mm-hmm. was the fuel storage. Then moving across was the garage shop with the heavy equipment, the dozers and, and that sort of thing, and a workshop for the electricians and the plumbers and that sort of thing. Then uh, one neck, another one was the fuel, was a uh, power plant, which was a megawatt of power because these are 750,000 uh, K- KWs one on the line and uh, one at the ready and one in maintenance, is okay. if there was a fire or okay. an explosion, you could shut that wing off and okay. still be in. The, then in, inside the station, there was one wing that had one area that had yet a smaller generator, and it had fuel. And then we had a, a reserve away from the station. It was a reserve for that. So if, in fact, it was a disaster, we could sustain life in that area. Mm-hmm. If that area went down, we then would move the population out to one of the science buildings, and uh, take there was there was a food cache that was buried out there, okay. and then we would contact they would contact us. If you remember the story of the uh, lady, the doctor that was rescued at uh, South Pole who worked on breast cancer herself, had a winter over. Oh, I did. Yeah, and that was the, that was the Air Force that came in with the okay. one thirty out okay. of Schenectady. Colonel Graham Pritchard was the commander of that. But anyway, it's the fact that mm-hmm. it, uh, you really can't get into it, and it's high risk in, in the darkness. So you said that during the winters, the snow would take over the buildings. How, how deep would that snow get? To, uh, like how much coverage would there be over that winter to where the, the, I'd imagine these buildings would be fine in the summertime yeah, then in the winter time they'd be covered the snowfall was in the range it ranged between three and eight inches per year only but it was the wind that would, would blow it across oh, so the okay. new station was built on columns 31 or 32 columns okay that took it uh, I'm not sure what the temp distance is about the service right now again mm-hmm. so that as it built up you okay, got to a certain so it's point. not precipitation per se; it's just snow being blown right, across. Right. The and and there was a maintenance plan to move the uh, move the, the drifting away each summer season as you started the season. Okay. And the ability to jack the station up and put another column in on top of it. Oh wow! Which you know? Yeah. Were there any scary stories that happened, or any any point in time where people needed to be rescued? Along the way, there was uh, a group of skydivers uh, uh, seasoned. They had jumped at the North Pole, and they were uh, Norwegian, French, two Americans, and, and, and another one may have been uh, uh, British. And they came in, and they they told us they were going to land, and the Runway is, is a, it's a federal facility, and the runway is maintained for military aircraft mm-hmm. for the 130s. And to have other aircraft coming in, we, we cannot uh, say that, that uh, you're approved for landing. But, okay, what are you going to do? <laughs> so yeah, they, where are you going to go? <laughs> where are you going to go? Yeah. So they landed the, uh, their twin otter, and they, they told us, you know, they were going to jump. Okay? And they said that the Norwegians were going to do tantum. And the balance uh, we're going to do, see, I think there were f- th- f- three, so that was five, I believe. The other, uh, uh, we're going to do a star configuration. They're going to come out and then and, and come in. They told us where they wanted, and we did some black tape, and this was going to be the LZ. They said drop zone, right? And we said, you know, this is a, you know, you're, you're at high altitude. Have you done this before? And they said, well, we don't work. We're, we're, 
we're experienced, we know how to do this. And I'm, I'm the NSF rep at the time, and uh, the station manager and I looked at each other, and we, we went to the dock, and we said, the MD, we didn't have PAs at the time, we said, we're going to need to have a standby should somebody get hurt, right? That sort of thing. So they were somewhat prepared, told everyone else at the station to stay away from the drop zone. And I said, uh, let's make sure that uh, I went and told McMurdo that, okay, here they are, and uh, they're, they're, uh, they just took off now, and we will keep you posted. So I had the comms set up so that uh, they were telling us then what we were doing outside then. I moved myself inside. The plane takes off, comes back around. We, they told us where the drop zone and the flight pattern was going to be. All of a sudden, the plane lands. First, the plane lands, and they said, well, have you seen anybody? Where are they? And we said, we, we believe we saw the first chute open, and that would be the tandem. And we said, we haven't seen anything else. The pilot turned around, got in the plane, and went back up. At that point in time, I told everyone, I said, we're going to go into the, into the crisis mode. I got a hold of the dock. I went back into comms. And at that very same time when I'm in comms, we get a call, and one of the individuals that was standing out doing something like a, uh, doing some forward ops on what's going on, giving us the report, said that, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the uh, Norwegians just came down on top of one of the James Ways fa- fabric-covered Quonset Hut MASH, mm-hmm. U.S. Army yeah. <laughs> surplus. And he said, uh, looks like they're okay. The one guy may have uh, twisted his ankle, but uh, he's limping. He seems to be okay. And we said, you know, obviously get a vehicle, get him into to the, to the dock. And he said, but we haven't seen anything else, and we're looking out into the area where we thought they should have landed. I know, we no more, no, no more than got that, and we're talking to the doc, and the call comes in, and the guy says, uh, we found him. I, we said, yeah. He says, we're going to need shovels and some body bags. And we went, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Wow. And uh, so we said, and he says, he said uh, we're going to have to have some uh, bigger people and shovels because he says they basically have augered in, in there in the suits. So do you think this this, the... Shoots never opened. It misread the altimeter. Apparently, I've got the article and, and oh, uh, some, uh, and they were they were. Right. But now there's still one guy missing. Okay. So all of a sudden we say this another guy came down on top of another James Way and he fell down. And it looks like he probably uh, broke his uh, clavicle or something. So we bring him into the station. Now the issue is I'm telling McMurdo that we've got you know three code blacks. Okay, and what are we going to? But and they said. Uh, have them, uh, you guys make the call, spend the night and get organized or just take, get everybody out of there. And so we had a meeting with some of the people within the station at all ranks and scientists. And we realized that uh, for a lot of people, most people, they hadn't seen somebody killed or dead or in a body bag. And so we, what we did is we said the vote was get them in a body bag, and we'll have to come up with something else. We'll take the bodies. We're going to put them, the body bags in the aircraft. We'll get the, Nor- Nor- the Norwegians if they need their ankle bandaged, and the other guy's going to get some sort of a sling, humanitarian assistance. We want him to call his family you know, along the way, and, get, and we'll refill the aircraft, and it flies out. Wow. Yeah. That's, and, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty scary. So they misread the altimeter or they just didn't realize the the altitude change there the uh, yeah, the one it's up at 9000 so, feet like if you open a chute up at 15 six, 15 16000 feet it's a much more opening shock you're going much faster through the air you can misjudge it pretty easily i've skyped i've skyped a couple times all right yeah. and um yeah definitely the high altitude can can change things i i haven't jumped but the uh if I recall, the one individual who was from Chantilly, Virginia, they, he had just gotten married, and his wife was a jumper also. And she said, if you're going to do this, uh, you have to have this new state-of-the-art, something or other that, that uh, when you jump for the start configuration after so many seconds, it'll all automatically deploy the chute, whatever it's they, called. They have that now. Yeah. yeah. He had it. The one guy who sur- or the guy who survived with the with the shoulder fracture, 
He yeah, said the last thing not. he saw, he said they were still going like this here. And then he says, he, he says, you know, yeah, he got pulled up, but uh, they didn't have that or it didn't work for whatever reason. Yeah. And I can imagine also you're skydiving over snow. So the white snow, you don't have the same depth perception. So it, that could have messed Good with point. Too. Yeah. 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 Wow. So that, that was the first realization of, of, of being part of a program where you're out in the middle of nowhere, but yet... There's uh, issues where uh, there's, there's tragedy. Yeah. And there's death. And how do you In handle? ways you wouldn't expect to. I would think Antarctica, there's plenty of ways to die. Skydiving would not be one that I would be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> worried about. But I guess if you're going to skydive in, our, in our, our Antarctica, it's going to be much more difficult. Um, well, that, that sort of brings me to another topic here. How is it governed? So you have Norwegians there, you have Americans. It seems to me like it's a bit of a free for all. Is it. Was it, it like that then? No, it's it, probably less so now, I, I would think. That's, that's a good question because in the uh, IGY year, 1957-58, where the United States and 12, no, the United States and 11 other countries decided to conduct science in Antarctica as a, as a, uh, as a country, along, like I said, with, along with 11 other countries. It was also part of the Cold War issue. And so the, the relationship with uh, Russia and everything was, uh, let's try to do something, let's keep it for science. And in doing that, at the end of that, that was so successful that in 1959, the 12 countries, the science community, the 12 countries got together and said, we should enter into a treaty, an Antarctic treaty that will preserve the continent of Antarctica for scientific usage only. And they did do that. And in addition to that, they indicated that it was not to be used for any mineral exploitation, because if you take a look at the origin of Antarctica, there's certainly going to be high probability of, 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 right. the, of that happening. And uh, uh, no claims to ownership and no usage for military purposes and or bases. That was ratified in 1961. And so there is all programs. Oh, and anyone performing science that's part of the treaty, or performing science has to exchange scientific uh, research data with the other countries. Okay. Were the Soviets signatories to that as well? <laughs> okay. What's interesting, you brought up a good question, mm -hmm. is the seven countries, is that there's going to be a few of them as I go along, mm -hmm. that uh, they, they have a flag at the South Pole. With, it's got actually a barber pole. <laughs> and uh, around it, it's got the uh, 12 nations, and it's called the ceremonial pole. And it's always moved, and it's always kept, uh, kept there. And it had, in order... The, uh, you have Argentina, okay? Uh, you have uh, Australia, you have Belgium, you have Chile, Australia, Argentina, France, Japan, interesting. New Zealand, of course, Norway, of course, and here's a unique one, South Africa, the Soviet Union. Of which the flag by the time that the flag was put up, it was a uh, it was the Soviet Union versus the USSR or uh, Russia, yeah, yeah or okay. Russia, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 and and uh, Great Britain and the USA. Okay, but to to look at the flags and uh, you see a Russian flag, but then Russia was was really focused on scientific research in, as opposed to uh, the Cold War and the military issues. That was when you were there. Yeah, the, seemed, the guys okay. that, that wintered over that first team of eight, 19 men who wintered at South Pole, they told me that in the middle of the season, the thing, the thing, they were they were stranded. They, they were out, you know, for the first time. We had people wintering over there. How are we going to get to them? Mm -hmm. Our four D was an aircraft that would come in, brought the first ones in. Then uh, I can't think what the is that brought the Air Force brought in, dropped everything out with uh, parachutes and the CVs, put it together. Was was the fact that uh, the the guy said one night I was at the radio, and he says I called everybody the, over the PA system. You, you, he said there's something in the sky and it's going beep beep beep, Sputnik. 
that came across. He said, he said the most exciting thing, he said it was unique things. He says, we were there when, when Sputnik came you could, through. How would he hear? Was it on some frequency? He must have, he must have picked oh, okay. it up. As okay. a, he was a ham operator. So okay. he must have picked it up on that. Wow. Sputnik. Sputnik, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sputnik. Today now Look there are 50 nations that uh, are okay. part of the treaty, some ascending, some non-voting, but they're interested in uh, what's happening at, uh, on yeah. the continent. Some of these countries weren't part of the program then, but what you find is you find countries who have a, a uh, interest in Antarctica and their, their proximity to the continent is such that to get to the continent and then get up on the continent shelf and build a station and maintain it is cost effective. Some countries are so far away of the, the route just to get there and supply. An example, your question was uh, the, the, the logistics. To get materials to Antarctica for South Pole Station or from McMurdo, once a year a resupply ship leaves from uh, Port Wainimi and it makes its journey to the Antarctic water, 60 degrees south, and there it's, it's met up and escorted in with the U.S. Coast Guard who cuts a channel, breaks a channel to get in and brings the ship in and they offload mm -hmm. cargo. They, they get retrograde and things that bring come back and they do that each year. Along with that, there's another vessel coming in and it's the tanker. It brings in the fuel and goes back out. To get from <clears throat> Wainimi to New Zealand to McMurdo is in the range of 10,000 miles. It's just short of one half the way around our planet Earth. Yeah. It is wow. a long, long distance. Then you have to plan to get to South Pole on a Herc flight, which is another 840 miles or a three-hour flight. So everything that we planned, huge pieces of steel, had to be planned and pre-tested for assembly two to three years before we needed it on site to get it on the vessel, offloaded, then next year bring it up to South Pole Station, and the sequence for everything had to be perfect. The issues, that the challenge, two challenges, number one is the fact 26,000 pounds payload, every single pound was accounted for to maximize the flights. Every piece of cargo had to meet the Air Force pallet uh, uh, requirements, mm -hmm. length, width, and height. And we couldn't have more than an inch, inch and a half between, to include the lug fasteners. Yeah. Human beings were given 300 pounds by themselves because of the gear that we had. So it was like going to the International Space Station. Everything had been accounted for. Science projects, science, science pro projects were getting to the point of sophistication and large uh, complexity that the yokes alone could be 30,000, 40,000 pounds. And then you've got all these pieces. Then you have the dish. We had, we had to, we, we finally realized the science community, the support contractor, the government, National Science Foundation, the team of government uh, engineers, that we needed to work together. And the government basically said this is, it was unprecedented, the size of the project, and NSF was a scientific research facility, basically. Mm -hmm. and uh, Or I should say a, a federal agency that dealt with scientific research, is that it wasn't going to happen. And all of a sudden we realized there's an American flag flying on the dome. We're part of this, and this is really special. And everyone bought into it. Became, I mean, we wanted to defy the naysayers. Mm -hmm. I remember the last time the last tank came in, the 10,000-gallon tank, the distance between that lug, those lugs and the bulkhead. Now you have to have people who are skilled to come up behind that aircraft with the forks and not jam that, that back ramp. Yeah. It, what was interesting, all the years was Navy and it was men. And when we first were doing this, it was all male. And then as females were hired, be, be the scientist or support personnel or whatever, we found that the females had more dexterity than the males, and they were <laughs> better off to bring it up to the aircraft, and it was a safer operation. Wow. Yeah, who would have thunk? <laughs> who would have thunk? Yeah, that's, that's funny. Yeah. That, yeah, it's, you know, I can't imagine being in that environment. The coldest I ever was in was in Canada, 
in, in January near north of Montreal, it was about minus 25. And I, it was just very brief. I, I was a baby when it was like minus five during the day. I couldn't even, I had two jackets on. I could feel the cold seeping into my bones. I'm like, I don't know how these people deal with it. And you're out there. I think that was summertime was, was still like minus 10, right? Average is minus 30. In the summer. Yeah. That's oh without the wind. Wow. Wow. I stepped off the aircraft twice on the first flight in, and the wind was had a slight breeze to it. Yeah. And when I stepped off, it went like this because you know, I knew what I was going to get into, and I knew that was going to happen. But I turned to the loadmaster was out there, and he says, uh, Jerry, welcome back. And I, I said, what's the temp? He said, with the wind chill, minus 75. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> uh, you're going to just, oh, my God. To To continue, the thing is that, the, the the bond between all of us was the success. It got to the point where the scientists said, we can't, we, we have to have this type of pedestal. We have to have this type of dish. We're going to break it down. And so we finally said, what if we put the a load master or two load masters at your institution while you're working on some of your final design? Work as a team so that maybe there's a design change that would be acceptable to the Air Force regulation and the HERC uh, constraints that would, that would allow us to have no problem. Bring it on, mm -hmm. we'll load it, not to mention we have the, the equipment to be able to handle it. And some of this stuff was somewhat sensitive, and then we'll, we'll get it over to the location where we'll assemble it. Yeah. And we did. Yeah. That's amazing. So switching gears a little yep, bit, what yep. would you do for fun out there when you're out there for so long? How much room do you have to socialize or play sports how, how is that the confinement is a is a real challenge there's a those a lot of us you uh, you uh, learn to live with it you knew what you were getting into recreation was important early on there was uh there was movies that you could you know play on the tv set watch movies before that the big thing was a library the advent of the uh uh the the VoIP phones, we were using a geosynchronous orbit, two junk satellites that if they did, when they made the, the curvature, the lowest curvature was eight degrees below zero. At that point in time, whatever the day was, and it would move, move each day a different by two or three minutes, is that you had to schedule your phone calls back to the U.S., be it family, or if you had a technical problem that we couldn't solve on site and I needed, we needed to get a hold of the electrical engineer mm -hmm. and the structural engineer and say, Here's our problem. Here are the three options based on what we have. You, what is it you want us to do? What is the best one to do? And if there's any thing. So that, that was an issue where there was, you could call it home. That was some of your recreation. Once you got to the VoIP and you got to the, uh, uh, what else did we have? Uh, Iridium phone. That we were allowed so many minutes per day, and there still was some of uh, hangar honors that early on wanted the uh, the ham station. You always had to have we always had a gym from the days of uh, even Bird Station. There was a gym. It was a plywood building, looked a lot like an oversized outhouse. You walked in, and there'd be uh, one, maybe two treadmills. There'd be uh, uh, free weights. Uh, yeah, there could be uh, stationary uh, bicycles. And there were, uh, I think, some rowing of some sorts. Man, not a, not a whole lot, though. And you're out there for how long? S four months, four and a half months. Oh, my gosh. The, it, it, now, the, um, there was also uh, classes where they... Uh, I'm going to fast forward to the new sure. station. New stations, we had, we had a gym that was a shorter course of, in terms of a basketball. Up above, we had... Uh, we had uh, it, was, it was a gym that had multiple stationary bikes and free weights and that sort of thing. We, they would have, uh, we had uh, uh, dance classes. All right. And we had uh, knitting classes and things like that. We're getting really exciting now. Yeah, I was getting really, <laughs> really exciting now. Uh, the way was, the knitting. There were certain days that uh, we had a, an established route that people could take skis and go out. I was going to say, like, how often would you go outside? I, I, all of us were outside every day a okay. portion of the time. Now, the, if, you're, if you're construction work and you're up on steel... That's a different situation. I, myself and, and other management people were in and out of the building uh, for definitely once each day at various times. My office was a quarter of a mile from 
the main station, and it was two pieces of, of, of a building that was used for a makeshift uh, housing, and we put them together, and that was... Uh, we, and you would just walk out there minus 70 degrees? No, no, not that. That, okay. that was a short-lived window of time as, okay. in the spring. That went away probably within the next two And then you were just days, inside the whole 30. time? When yeah. It, you, you get used to it, though. Okay. You, you've got the gear. You know how you take your balaclava with you. You've got the goggles. You, you, you got In those days, it was construction. All of us had a hard hat. Uh, you, you had uh, had gloves with you. Mm-hmm. You learned to take an extra pair of socks. You had the, the bunny boots, which you tended to perspire in them. And if you're out walking around, you'd you'd watch each other for the white spots for the uh, on your nose cross bite on okay. the and on the under the eyes. With that, does that hurt? Or would I would think when it gets so cold, you may not notice it. You don't. But then there's that's a ping. Be there's scary. a pinging. You know, ding ding. You can of almost pain, <laughs> and that's the indication that you're getting frostbite and and, and toes. Toes will go numb, for, and then all of a sudden you can yeah. walk around, and then you take the shoes off, and if they're white, now you've got to get them oh, warm, man. but you've got to do it at a, a t- bring that temperature down. I, I, would, so. I would die. I hate it. I go skiing, and yeah. I, my toes are the first yeah. thing to go, and it's so uncomfortable. We had people that played chess, mm-hmm. playing cards. We, we actually had a, a, a building that was going to be torn down, and... Uh, an individual uh, was a uh, was a rock climber, and so he brought all the the uh, the, the uh, stones and all that stuff to put in, just like you'd go into mm-hmm. a sporting shop, and you could climb up with your daughter and you have the ropes, that sort of thing. Uh, we actually would go for runs on the runway. Some of us would. It's, is it a, is it a paved? surface or it's purely ice do they even attempt to put any paved surface down no, that runway? No, it's, it's it's just a plowed out compaction area. we, we oh, take a compact. d8 with a chain and we we okay. get the compaction we walk it x number of days per week okay. and it's uh, per uh, air force regulations on compaction okay for 130 interesting yeah i could i couldn't imagine landing on on ice it's again it's the depth perception that's the problem it's like trying to fly over any slick surface that's the same color there's no change and it's easy to crash there's on uh, ice outside of McMurdo now that they do bring in C-17s and, okay. and bring them down uh, an area, and then uh, they move cargo back to uh, Christchurch because they get a bigger okay. payload. Okay. Wow. We actually uh, experienced uh, twice two seasons where they would come down on a training run out of uh, McCord, come out of McCord, and they would drop uh, cargo and, and stuff to, for practice training for the pilots to do it if they had to come in during the winter. Mm-hmm. So we, we set up the, the LZs and the station would come on. We had a line where no one could come by and, and we were talking to them. And then they'd come by and they'd do, you know, do a pass and then they would say, okay, here we come. And uh, it was, it was uh, yeah. exciting. for it, it, it was an event that yeah. uh, it was like recreation. We yeah. said everybody can come out you know, unless you're mission critical back in the station, but you'll stay behind the line and everybody got to cheer and uh, then it would tip the wings and fly back. Yeah. And we had two Air Force reps on uh, boots on the ground on the ice with us. Yeah. Uh, one was out of New Zealand and one was U.S. out of uh, with, with the, uh, the group. Yeah. So those were fun things to do. Christmas was uh, great. The, the food was great. The cooks were, were hired and the chefs were just great. They cared about the people. And they would cook uh, three meals a day. And during the winter, during the summertime, we served. So we had three shifts: morning, afternoon, and evening. And then we had, uh, uh, I guess, another fun event is when the Herks would come in from uh, from McMurdo with freshies, eggs, milk, fruit, lettuce, and then we'd get our portion. And everybody would be asked to volunteer to. Uh, could get with the load masters and help the stuff that was perishable to get it from the aircraft into yeah. the station before it froze. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I, I always found that being deployed is f- more fun in some ways. You get more attention, better food, more <laughs> entertainment. These people feel so bad for you. They don't like, oh man, I'm actually getting treated pretty well. So, so anything that you would uh, do differently about the career? Anything that you look back like, oh, I wish I would have maybe done that instead. Um, How'd you feel about the whole thing? Because that's, that's quite an adventure. I would not change anything. It, uh, I retired in 2009, and then I, I, was, I went back, and I did a couple more seasons. 
And when I realized that if I could pass a physical, I could do this for a long period of time, but I was being selfish because I never worked a day in my life when I worked with the Antarctic program. It was a passion. I loved it and worked around the clock. Could care less if it was more than whatever the number of hours you were getting paid. Well, we were federal employees, so on salary, right? Uh, so it, it exceeded expectations. And thanks to Elena, who was uh, supportive of family and everything and all the long deployments, I was able to live my dream. And I, had, I was a team member of some of the most incredible human beings on the planet Earth, the military personnel, the Air Force, early on the Navy, the support contractor, the National Science Foundation Office Polar Programs, the U.S. Uh, uh, subject matter experts design team, and all the consultants. It, it was Oh, and the scientific community, of course, that's why we're there. Mm-hmm. Just an incredible Incredible yeah. bond of individuals. How many years were you there total, if you could add it all up? 21. 21 or, years. Yeah, their, their, their deployments are 22, but if you, there were times where every, many times. 21 be, times that you've yeah, been. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There, okay. Each there, time there was. Be, no, well, 21 years, but some of the deployments were wow. not full season. Because every, yeah. I think it was every three years, I had the option of coming back for two weeks either at Christmas or Thanksgiving. Over the course of 21 with the, years. With, yeah, for my family. Then there were times where I'd be, we'd be on the ice and there was something that had happened back at Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. double deployment back. Wow. So if, if, you, if, you, if you look at the number of months, okay, five years is 60 months. Mm-hmm. I think I'm pegging 58 of my life. 58 months total in Antarctica. With the exception, you got to take that there was, if you, t- if you want to become a real civil engineer, you, engineer, you take the 58 minus, uh, I'm going to be, say, four at bird station. So okay, that's, now you got. It's a long time. Yeah. Years, many years. It, down it's there approaching the five. The world. It's yeah. approaching, it's pegging five. It's a long time. Of my, of my life. <laughs> that's a long time. Wow. Would you, what would you recommend to a young person who wants to pursue this kind of career? Well, if they do, I would suggest that they go on the website to nsf.gov and Google that, and then go to a link or ask the question uh, that you're interested in employment in Antarctica. How can I get a job in Antarctica? They will provide you with a link that will take you to the, the home website of the current government support contractor for Antarctica. And there, that would be the beginning. And, you know, we always say that uh, you can go in there and you can work in a dish pit as being a dishwasher. You can go there as the uh, station doctor. You can work as uh, someone who handles fuel. You, you, can, you can be uh, someone who handles uh, as a cook. All the, the, the components of the city, you have the opportunity to be part of that with the exception of the scientific research team itself. And then again, if you want to go to another level, you can become a scientist yourself, and or you could join the federal government Office of Polar Programs. And in today's world, uh, I uh, have to say you can join the United States Air Force. They have the contractor. Yeah. They're the contract to fly in and out. And you could be a mechanic. You could be a someone who's handling food service or something at McMurdo. Uh, Tons of ways. It uh, seems to me we once we had a, a crew that came in uh, in, a, in a cockpit, all females. And uh, it, you know, it wasn't uncommon at the uh, last years of my career to, to get on aircraft. I normally knew all the loadmasters, and they knew me. And here's one or two female lo- loadmasters. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a different world. Yeah. So male or female, there, there are opportunities. Yeah, almost literally, it's a different world. It's, it's yeah. incredible. And you, then you have the option of if you really like it and it becomes part of you, you can try to win her over, which is if you can win, if you can complete a successful season in the summer in Antarctica, that's one thing. If you can do the winter over, it is an incredible thing, incredible thing to have on your resume. Yeah, because it it demonstrates that you 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 can undertake difficult tasks, you know how to work in development of solutions, and you know how to work with people 
And at a certain level, you have people skills. Therefore, you become a very desirable employee. Yeah. Or you could. If you can make it in Antarctica, you can make it anywhere, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and again, today's world in IT, I mean, the communications is huge. Mm -hmm. And they have the, in in the new station, we had a conference room to see you, see me with the big screens now. And you can, you're doing everything, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like being on Zoom right now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's that's uh, that's impressive. Um, and write lots of letters and don't give up, and tell people what you want. It sounds like that's that's what that's what got you there. Never give up. And as when I as when I got in the car with the uh, suitcase in the vehicle, I looked in the rear view mirror as we were driving away, and from that point in time, I have never looked back again. Stay focused. Yeah. Don't, don't ever give it up. Now. Things are changing. You know, it costs more to go to college than when I did. But, but at the same time, you find a way. It was it was yeah. something that uh, I'm very proud of, of doing it myself. With one exception, once I was selected to be a government employee, that last that that chapter of my life was what I was always destined to be part of. And without a hesitation, my wife Elena said, "I'm here to support you. I didn't do it alone." Yeah, that's great. Oh, I bet. I bet. And there's those are not some like, like any couple, military or not. Yeah. There are always some rough times along the way. For, if you deploy, you're going to, for summer season, you're going to miss Halloween. You're going to miss Thanksgiving. You're going to m- miss Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. And if you're married, the real killer. You're not going to get home in time for Valentine's Day. It's a great excuse, though. It's a great excuse. You can only break even on Valentine's Day, so at least you're in Antarctica. You have a good excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Bring back something nice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's 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 if you go during the Summers, summer, yeah, which is the the better season. So you miss more of the holidays. It, so you go in the winter time and you miss fewer holidays. I Fourth suppose. of July. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. You can just light off fireworks somewhere. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll bore you with uh, two, two other things. Sure. In between uh, Antarctic support contracts with Holmes and Arbor and becoming a federal employee, Holmes and Arbor lost a contract. Uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot. They're competitively bid every 10 years. Maybe that's changed today. I'm not sure. And the competitive bid uh, uh, found themselves in a situation where it was awarded to another company. Okay. And with that, the projects that I was working on uh, were transitioned, transferred to this other company. So I told my the the uh, I, Elaine and I uh, are married, and we had uh, both been to Antarctica together in seventy four seventy five as a husband and wife team employed. And so we were trying to determine. I said, I want to stay with you guys, and, and let's. How about a project overseas? That's uh, obviously we're not going to be able to go to Antarctica for another ten years, maybe. And he said, Well, there happens to be this HUD project in Micronesia in Palau, in a remote island of Koror, uh, and we're going to be building HUD Section Eight homes for a low income. We built some on Majro and uh, Bikini. No, it was Majro and Johnson Atoll. And we've built some in Guam. And we need a, 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 somebody needs to go out there and be the overall project manager, needs to handle the budget, the schedule. And you're going to be basically the only two out there. Americans will support you from the states. Someone's going to have to do material takeoff and put everything on, on a sh- tanker or on a ship and bring it down and store it and work with a local contractor. And we were there for a year, and that that was a challenge because there were things that uh, that, uh, for example, the equipment that the, the contractor didn't have the equipment, and when we needed dozers to clear the uh, area, I found many uh, errors on the uh, topographic maps in terms of the survey. The monuments were being taken by the local people because there was an agreement with the Japanese. They took them. It was occupied by Japan. Next to it is truck where it was, it was there on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, right? Is the fact that it, we found in a, a TD-14, 1956 Navy dozer half submerged in the water. And they said, that's the one you guys are going to use. And, and I'm looking at this bluff 
So we said, well, we need a, a mechanic to get out here and, and get this thing fixed. And so I arranged for that. A guy, and he said, well, there's a cam, some sort of cam on the clutch is, is broken. We drug it out of the water, and, and the mechanic shows up. And it's, it's not funny, and I'm not making fun. It's culture. He's got a pair of, of uh, sandals, a short pair of shorts, a T-shirt, and he's got a, a rasp file with the, the wooden piece broken off, and it's taped. And he's got the cam, a piece of metal, between his knees, and he's trying to get the configuration of the cam. I knew then that we had a challenge. It, it, we, we fought those challenges every single day in that, in that area, and we uh, defied the odds again, and we achieved the goal, and we, we left uh, with it. Then before the, the, the discussion of the new station was, was uh, starting to reach all of us who had been to Antarctica before, and one of the pre- individuals I work with had, was part of the project early on, and he said, Jerry said, uh, you know, if, if we do this, would you be interested in the, in the uh, position? I said, yes, I would. In the interim, H&N had a contract with Aramco on the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, Daharan, Uthmania, Udalia, a few others. And I was sent, spent uh, two uh, brevet t- uh, assignments uh, doing, we do handle some survey, and we handle some, uh, or, 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 oh, it's going to be, Five, five or six camps supporting ten thousand construction workers total this is in Saudi. Yeah, yeah, uh, and so I was on that project for a period of time. Now Elena was not able to come with me on that, so that was another one. I'm gone again, and I'm back. <laughs> and how long were you in Saudi Arabia? I think again it was a brevet. I think uh, it, the total was, uh, you know, a, a couple of months, with the exception that. The, the uh, procurement, which was massive on the scale and all of the design, it was such a large project that the, we rented multiple warehouses in Las Vegas and took everything out, and they became the war room with all the schedules on yeah. the wall and that sort of thing. I think that yeah. the time and the entire project, I want to say, may, may have been approached a half a year to a year. Maybe okay. yeah, so in that window. So it wasn't wasn't a long period of time, but it was yet another one of those remote parts yeah. of the world. And now you're dealing with the religion, the politics, and the yes. language. Yeah, Saudis. I have not been there. I've been all over the Middle East, just not Saudi. And uh yeah, it's different. It's uh you see women covered up and that that's Riyadh. I, I I've heard other parts of Jeddah are, are more liberal, but it's a definitely a struggling country in many ways. We had we were told what to do and what not to do, and we lived in the Aramco compound, and we were driven everywhere. Yeah. But they said when you walk through the uh, when you when you go through immigration, they said that uh, they'll be there with AK forty sevens and they'll take your passport. Mm-hmm. And remember this, and remember it clearly, they'll give it back to you if you have not violated any civil or religious crimes. Oh boy. That's a large category. <laughs> what years were you in Saudi? This is in the maybe the eighties. You said no. It was. It would have been uh, eighty days, eighty to eighty-two, something okay. like that. Early eighties. I'm going to take yeah. that entire window for the, the project. Yeah. Yeah. And That's... and and, and uh, you know, it's like you walk down the street with with somebody who you know was a Saudi. You know, and, and you may have looked over here at a store or looked down, and maybe you've committed some sort of the, one of those yeah, crimes. Yeah, you wouldn't know it. I would not. I know, I know. I, I've heard really crazy stories of, of women, American women, going over there under some government agency, and then they're not covered up in a certain way, and then they get in trouble, and then and they don't just give you a ticket if you do something wrong. It, it could be, you know, chopping off hands or something like that. And so yeah. it's, it's yeah. definitely a, a different world. Wow. So from uh, as a farm boy from Wisconsin to the into the army, into Antarctica, to Saudi Arabia, um, you come a long way. That's Plop, Micronesia for a Micronesia year. Micronesia as well. Yeah. And again, Elena and, was an employee again. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Her as well. And that's uh, <laughs> and now it makes sense that you settled in Southern California. It's <laughs> you can't you know, do out the retirement years in a in a more hospitable place. So. 
it's actually funny. I used to do a fair amount after the Army climbing with the Sierra mm-hmm. Club and became an assistant instructor on mountaineering. So we did a lot of rappelling and all the stuff, which we did out of Huey's at Fort Polk mm-hmm. and camping out. And now when I go out with a bunch of guys, we just go up to Mojave or something, spend a night or two and do some camping and whatever. And I'm telling myself, I'm getting cold. I can't have <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly would not want to live in uh, in a place that is cold. I mean, I still yeah. am really glad. I grew up in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin, yeah. proud of it, and enjoy going back for high school reunions, That's university right. reunions. Antarctica, no problem. And then you go up in the mountains in California and you get cold. But yeah, uh, yeah, Jerry, impressive. Thank you so much for, for uh, teaching us about your life and uh, about specifically Antarctica and everything else you've done. So um, it uh, you definitely come along. With, yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. One thing I forgot, and it's uh, it is a, I love me, is when you talk about uh, achieving it exceeded expectations because you had support. Somebody would say, "What is the most impressive thing that that uh, you did and you received for it?" And of course, the most impressive thing is the support from Elena, twofold is one of the awards if, in fact, you have provided an outstanding uh, contribution to the, the uh, successful completion of something in Antarctica or you found something, the scientific research that's a Nobel Prize or that sort of thing, or if you've been a key component in something that uh, is unique to science, a, a Antarctic feature will be named after you. And it's going to be recorded by USGS. And normally it's like a, a president or someone that's of, of importance. The stamp is processed, you know, after when you're gone, when you're dead, right? The uh, I was awarded the, uh, uh, there was a group of us that uh, were the team key people. Actually, I should say that they all were key people. So I'm a little bit embarrassed how that I was chosen because I was just one of the team. A, a range called the Marty Nunat Tax, which are the peaks of, of the, the mountains with snow around them. And that's one thing. But on my retirement, the colonel, because yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get anyone, at the, uh, and commander at, uh, at McMurdo, who I still know to this day, and you'll see a picture of he and I standing by the Herc, told the, uh, I'm up in the cockpit, and I knew all these guys, and we're always talking about this, that, and the other thing. And he said, well, you know, so we took off, they took off, and they, 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 you know, they tipped the wings. I went, God, come on, guys, it's, I'm just retiring. They said, he says, uh, if, uh, we're not that far off the flight pattern where Jerry's feature is. To, have, to see your feature when you're alive is almost impossible because how do you get there? There's no way you're going to get an aircraft to go there. And to have one that's not that far off a flight pattern was, I had no clue. I'm sitting up there, and all of a sudden, I heard the, the, the pilot say, we got it, and so he's bank a little bit to the left, and he says, uh, Jerry, you want to see your feature? And I went, you got to be kidding me. Oh, that's great. So out, to, out behind the pilot, looking out that window, and then I, was, I got up, and I was able to take in the front with the bar. That some, they're, I'll show them to you. They're not yeah. the best pictures, but that was great. And what's the, name, what's the actual name of it? Then? Marty. My last name is Marty. Mm-hmm. Noon attacks. Noon, Noon attacks are uh, peaks. They're, I think they're called like uh, angels in the sky. That uh, there's there's a range of, of mountains and, and the snow is covered. And there's there's mm-hmm. a peak in a row or a okay. plateau in a row. Okay, and they named that after you. Yeah, and it, and wow. I've got I've got the photo from the air that I All didn't right. take. USGS did satellite imagery, and uh, one of the orig- one of the maps, and you can see it. The other one was was the uh, the Minuteman Award from the U.S. Air Force. The Minuteman Award, which which is uh, nor, it's, um, not given to very many uh, civilians, but it, it's your contribution uh, in support of the uh, of the one hundred ninth or the Air, something in the Air Force, mm-hmm. and so there's you know, that was not something you you walk around the block and somebody gives to you, but yeah, but the, I I I always had the ability. And that was because of not only work ethic, but but my short brevet a period of time in the in the military. Whenever military personnel would come in, and there was always someone from the guard, originally Navy, that was a, a captain, you know, and they worked themselves up through oh five and oh six, mm-hmm. right? So I, I worked with them all the time. Is that and I realized that other civilians in conversation, they would say, Hey Greg, you're in uniform, and it would be Sir Colonel, 
or, or a general, and I always supported them that way, mm -hmm. always respected them that way. And the word got out that, you know, Jerry was a veteran. I said, hey, I did two years. Come on. It, but the, the relationship there is, is in when, they, when the airplanes came up, uh, they used to come in, if they, uh, and the, the guys would, of course, the guys came maybe to look at the girls too. But anyway, they came in, and we would give them uh, cookies. And they, they got to walk around. And, of course, can we walk over to the South Pole and have our picture taken? And then afterwards we would say, yeah, and I would say, yeah, but then I said, I'm also going to give you a certificate signed by us that you stood at the South Pole. So we made sure that they, the military, was always taken care of because if it wasn't for them, we weren't going anywhere. You guys flew this stuff up. Yeah, that's a, a, very much a joint effort. Yeah, and, and I heard many a story yeah. when they realized we were in trouble with the schedule and they had heard that somehow the materials weren't getting there. I think Colonel Smith, Ronnie, said there were times he says we had to get the guys that were on their rest shift would get out of bed and go over to that one at 30 and says, we're going to help these guys get their stuff. We're not going to yeah. let them down. Wow, that's fantastic. Where do you get that kind of stuff? It's a it's huge, a huge <laughs> joint effort. Yeah, I mean, you're contributing so much to them and them to you, um, and you can't survive without that coordinated effort and that, that common bond. So that's We, that's we get together. I tell you what, if there's yeah. any people say, do you miss it? And I miss it. And I'm saying I'm glad to be with my wife and with our grandchildren. But I said, there's not a day goes by that I don't, I don't reflect yeah. on that camaraderie. Yeah. At another time when we have more time over mm -hmm. libation, I'll tell you about <laughs> how I broke the rules, but we set a new precedent on how we relocated the flag from the dome to the new station and how we... Uh, it's, it's, it involves drinking? No, it did, oh, okay. no, no. no. <laughs> Maybe it should. And, and some of the no. things that I saw at poll that that are off the record. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we'll, we'll get something on the record on a, on a future show. I think I mentioned um, one to your dad. He said, do you have any more of those? And I said, yeah, but I don't think we want to talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Maybe, maybe one day. We'll see. It, it, it has to do with the issues that when it was all male, it was one thing. When you have male and female, people say, what are the issues? And I'm saying, it's no different than any other place in any other small town anywhere in the world. Yeah. Everything that occurs there has occurred, and I've seen at South Pole Station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you just have to, some point in time, you, you see it, and you go, got it. Next morning, you still say hi to Sally, you still say hi to Jim, <laughs> because we're a team. If they haven't, I mean... You gotta, you gotta, gotta survive together. <laughs> you gotta make it. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, Jerry, thank no, you no. so much okay. for, uh, for doing this, and um, yeah, we'll go up and take a look at the I Love Me wall. All right, that's it, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to follow the show, you can on Facebook or Instagram. Also, if you'd like to email me about a show idea or if you'd like to be on the show, you can uh, do so at gregcrinoshow at gmail.com. All right, take care and see you next time.